Good morning. Uh, my name is Constance, and I'm going to talk today about a prototype that actually failed and what we managed to learn from it anyway. Um, so first I want to tell you a little bit about who I am and why in the world I would look at something like a games-based program to ameliorate kids who hate school and their uh, low performance. Um, this is the building I actually work in. I'm in a school of education. It's quite a staid crowd. And if you look down the hallways where I work, um, there are folks like Michael Apple, Gloria Lanson Billings, some of the most important scholars in education today. In the meantime, you have my group. We all study games. We study play, games, and fun is not considered a very dirty word. And yet we think that we're also out to save the world in the same kinds of ways. Hopefully I can demonstrate that. Now, I study massively multiplayer online games. How many people here at least know what that is, World of Warcraft, et cetera? Good, because I'm not really going to spend much time defining the technology. Um, but my early work, I started off, when, when I first got into this, no one had really done much work in terms of cognition and learning from these spaces. So I actually went and did eight months of field work. I lived in this world right here, in the world of Land of Aden from Lineage 1. I spent eight months there doing field work. Um, and since that time, and with the help of various funders like Spencer and MacArthur, I managed to take that dissertation work and trim it down into looking at five key topics. Now, I'm kind of a data or a research wonk, I have to admit to you. So I spend a lot of time looking at kids and play and what in the world are they getting out of the time they spend with something like MMOs or online games, et cetera. Um, because they do actually learn. So I, I look at data, for example, of in-game play. I look at data that includes forums um, of people who play elves online and them discussing various strategies. I look at the constellation of what some scholars call paratext, but that constellation of fandom around these kinds of titles all played voluntarily and all played with a subscription fee. And I look at issues like, for example, um, how much of the forum data is actually social knowledge construction? Or um, how much is dedicated toward uh, thinking through systems or model-based reasoning? Um, looking at the tacit epistemologies, the kinds of attitudes toward knowledge that young people actually uh, display in these kinds of environments. Um, reading levels, I do very mundane work like looking at what is the average reading level of game text. And a lot of these data surprise people who don't play. Um, they're shocked to find out that it takes high school graduation to actually understand most game text, or that 86% of what happens on the forums is problem solving, not mom jokes. <laughs> so it turns out my research to date has sort of been trying to demonstrate that online play has this incredible intellectual life, that what kids are doing is important, that in fact, thinking about play as an integral part of learning, we're really graded it up till about fourth grade, and then we tank out and treat play as this barren, act, uh, barren sort of almost um, um, naughty behavior until graduate school, possibly, and even then, knock on wood. Um, so a lot of my work has been demonstrating this, right? But there's this question that started to come out in my own work. After spending time looking at kids playing outside of school, you have to ask yourself, well, then why isn't it that the kids who are playing games aren't faring better in our school classrooms? So today I'm going to talk about a prototype of a program we did for two years where we had this incredibly naive and awesome idea. And I'll tell you about its failure, but hopefully what we learned. Um, the idea was that we would use something like World of Warcraft. I kid you not. World of Warcraft as kind of a gateway drug into thinking or a gateway sort of activity into revitalizing um, young people's intellectual interests and their lives. So thinking about it as a vehicle for doing scientific reasoning, for doing reading, since we know that that's part of what it means to play outside of classrooms. Um, formally, the research question was essentially, can we build a bridging third space based on these online games that would incubate key norms and practices that we saw happening naturally, especially for boys? Now, if you're not familiar with this, um, I've gotten interested because I now have two very small young boys that um, I call my own, but also because my PhD is actually literacy studies, and it turns out that um, that young men, young boys are having real issues, particularly around literacy. Just to scare you, 65% um, of boys graduate, and if you break that down by ethnicity, the story is even more dismal for anyone of any shade of color. 
Boys out, uh, underperform and opt out of literacy coursework. They score lower on the NAAP. Um, and yet, the places that I study are traditional play spaces for boys, right? So there's something going on when the places that my research has documented is so vital um, to doing reading and science and math are, in fact, the, the same crowds are doing so poorly in classrooms. So we did something very bizarre. Um, we decided that we would run this after-school program for, young, for adolescent boys. Um, so there's a picture from our lab. Here's what it looks like in the game. We created guild structures, and very briefly, we decided we ran it for two years. We ran a pilot and then the full study, um, so about 25, 30 kids total. Um, these were kids from, I'm, I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, so this was kids not only from Madison, but up to two hours out. When parents found out about what we were doing, I didn't even have to recruit. Parents from up to two hours away drive their kids to campus in order to participate because there's a lot of parents out there that know that their kids are doing all of this great stuff around their gameplay spaces, but not interested in school at all. Um, so we met once a month on campus. We used the guild structures in the game to play together regularly, typically several nights a week. Um, and we had guild forums. And then I gathered just an incredible amount of data trying to understand uh, what would happen if we tried this. Now, our original idea was the prototype that failed. I had this fabulous idea that we would, for the first semester, focus on um, writing and reading around guild websites, that we would build this fabulous website, we would learn about graphic design, do a lot of design thinking. And then the second semester, I had graphic novelists coming in, and we were going to do graphic novels around WOW, and this all sounds really fabulous, right? Um, so it should have been, and it turned out that this idea absolutely broke. And it broke based on what I will actually call um, the let me know when she stops talking problem. <laughs> so here I was spending two years in after school program. I had this you know, elite, fabulous research team. And yet for these young men, every time I started talking, honest to gosh, they would lean back in their seats and pull their hoodie over their head <laughs> and look at me like this going, let me know when she stops talking, right? And then when I would stop talking and actually we'd go back to gaming, they would pull their hoodies back and they would totally engage in the game. So I had this problem. I was trying to turn their play spaces into something that for them looked and felt like school. Now for me, as someone in a school of education with my very serious and earnest sort of education colleagues, I thought what I was doing didn't look and felt like, felt like school at all. But for them, in fact, it did. So that was the prototype that failed. So we had to revise our strategy some. And what did we do? Um, well, we decided instead to step back, and instead of having these sort of structured activities, instead we just let it be a free-for-all. We had resources there and a lot of people that they could interact with, but essentially we just decided, well, follow your interests, and when something comes along, we'll bring it in. So for example, when two young men started reading wild graphic novels, I ran out to Borders, I bought a crap ton of them, I hauled them in and said, oh, look, I've got some. Why don't you read them? Something like that. <laughs> so <clears throat> we did this for two years, right? Running around, trying to chase their interests and document what would happen if we just sort of gently resourced their interests. We had a bunch of topics that we were really interested in and a lot of data and some coding that was highly reliable. But here's where it gets interesting. So these are the themes that we were interested in based on my previous research of topic areas that we thought were specific targets for something like gameplay, right? OK, profile's interesting. But it actually gets more interesting when you compare it to, we did an analysis last year, comparing our program to Global Kids in New York. Now, Global Kids, if you're not familiar with them, is a fabulous, fabulous program that uses Teen Second Life and very structured activities with paleontologists, and they do a lot of work. It's really quite gorgeous online kind of educational stuff, right? But really, the main thing that was different was that ours was this messy, interest-driven, we're using a game, we, we bribed them with pizza, you know, kind of a mess of two years, and we compared our data to global kids, which was much more structured, much more educationally driven, they knew their goals, and they knew how to design toward them. And here's where things got interesting. It turned out that, though you could say that there were some areas that, you know, some places that their program was better at, some places ours was better at, for example, reading, digital media literacy argument were places that something like WOW, believe it or not, did better than, um, than structured educational programs in Teen Second Life. 
But actually what's surprising is if you look at it, the profiles are really markedly similar. Now this should shock us because the, the thing that we ended up uncovering was that both programs essentially ended up getting to the same goals, even though theirs was this very, very nice piece of curriculum and ours was this interest-driven holy hell mess, right? So what we ended up realizing was that it was interest that was driving the learning, not the technology, and not the games, and not the narratives. But it was the fact that they were interested in the first place. Now, see, I'm a cognitive scientist, and I do like little wonky research studies. So for me, trying to get at something like motivation, or engagement, or interest is very, very painful, right? I know how to document intellectual practices, but when it comes to something like passion, I just kind of go, whoa, I don't know what to do with that. So that's where we were at. But we did decide, let's try and actually pin it down empirically. And I want to give you a small taste of what these data look like. So again, I tend to be an old lit geek. So um, I wanted to look at their reading performance in particular, because young ad teenage guys really do struggle in, about, uh, around reading in America. So we ran a quick study with the boys. We decided to look at what does it look like? How does their reading performance care on school-based text versus game-based text? when they're given choice or not, right? And here's a, a quick overview. So we did the study, we compared the two, we had counterbalances and everything else you need for rigor. Um, here's what the materials look like. So we had them read um, a text from the game. We compared it with literally text that we had them bring in from their textbooks. We had them bring their books in and we sampled text that would be appropriately level. What did we find? Well, when you look at the uh, overall, these are the, the boys listed down. All of our kids read at or below level. The biggest difference between grade level and reading level was actually about, uh, let's see, that would be five grade levels below level. The average was about two grades below level, and that means our, 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 our young men in our group were representative, because that's typical. When you compare their difference on game text versus school text, when we chose the topics, there were no differences, none. No differences. Performance on reading looked just like perform performance on reading in games looked just like performance on reading when it came to school. So we decided, all right, well, let's now let's have them choose the text. And this is analytically very uh, late, uh, cumbersome. We went to them back. We went back to them. We said, okay, so we want you to pick, name three topics you're working on right now around the game. And they gave us those, and we decided to pick the hardest text we could find online out of the authentic resources around games to take these struggling readers and the readers at level and, and see what their performance would be like. Here's what we got. Well, first, on average, remember, we had either kids were reading at level or up to five grades below level. And on average, these texts were 4.5 reading grades above what they should be capable of reading with understanding. So we gave them really hard text. But when they were allowed to choose the text, these young people read up to eight grades above their head when they were allowed to choose the topic. Now, why would this be? Now, here I divided up the struggling readers versus non-struggling readers. Another way for me to put this is that struggling readers look just like non-struggling readers when you give them choice. So why would that be? Well. If you open up the transcripts, here's one place where you see a big difference. Um, when they had no choice on the text, there is something called a self-correction rate. Um, so when they read these texts, you know, most readers, all of us, come to words we don't get. Subtle. It has a weird B in it, okay? So when you have to say it out loud or read it, it's kind of difficult. A good reader uh, struggles with it but then fixes it, self-corrects and moves on. That's considered a, a strong reading behavior, not an error. So when we compared school versus games, and we looked at when they had no choice, their self-correction rate was at 17%. When we gave them choice, that nearly doubles. So at like point P is 0. 0.000001, right? It's more than double. What does this mean? It means that when the kids actually give a damn about what it is they're reading, they actually will persist in the face of enormous comprehension challenges. So what you're seeing is that it's their willingness to actually fix their own comprehension during their activities that shores up their performance on the topic. So I'm going to try and sum it up because I'm out of time. What's the moral of the story? The moral of the story for us was that we really had to shift 
from thinking about games or our technology as this means toward an educational end, and instead think about um, something like education as a mean towards their end. You know, this is a shift that I'm advocating that is really trying to think about education as something more akin to community organizing. That means that, you know, Al Giordano, this fabulous um, uh, guerrilla um, journalist, talks about when you community organize, the first thing you do is ask the community, what do you need? And then you organize around what the community wants. So if there's one thing I think is the big story for us was realizing that education should look just like that, starting with kids' own interests. And I'll stop there. If you like this interest, um, there's a website. Thank you. Thank you.